So dear, dear colleagues, let's get prepared. We're starting shortly. You might need headphones, Excellencies. Japan Minister, Russia. Uh, Minister, please. Um, I'm glad to greet and give my American and my British colleagues. This is the first um, meeting in my new position of Minister of Foreign Affairs with um, uh, Anthony and David. Uh, this is the excellent format. We had uh, a wonderful atmosphere, very productive talks, not just uh, on the premises of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also in the wings. And uh, there were there was a meeting with the President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, as real allies, we had that meeting. We are grateful to the US and the UK for the unwavering support rendered to Ukraine, its territorial integrity and sovereignty. That was a very busy day for both our guests and our state. It's very important that Anthony and David participate in the fourth summit of the Crimean platform. It's today, um, it started today, it's to be continued. Fair and sustainable peace is impossible without uh, restoration of sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, and that includes the Crimea. Crimea is Ukraine. Today, on the 11th of uh, September, we have a tragic um, anniversary for the American U.S. people, the 23rd um, anniversary of terrible terrorist attacks against the U.S. I offered my condolences to the state, Secretary of State and uh, through him to all the nation. We know the price of human life and we know how um, uh, loss hurts. So the principal topic we discussed was uh, military capability in their reinforcement, air defense, F-16s, munition, drones, uh, armored vehicles, and other equipment, everything that can work for victory. And specifically, emphasize the necessity to make investment to buy military systems uh, for the uh, defenders of Ukraine that will support our defense industry and save the resources provided by our allies. The key mission is to strengthen the uh, air shield uh, with um, all the necessary contributions. We have to remove all the obstacles and limitations with the use of the British equipment, American equipment in the territory of uh, Russia against uh, military targets. We need need um, also um, decisiveness in uh, downing uh, Russian rockets and missiles and drones over the territory of Ukraine. That will provide for sustainable peace and strong position of Ukraine. The ballistic missiles provided by Iran to Russia was another issue. Enemies of the free world have no doubts. They provide uh, unacceptable threats uh, for Europe and Middle East. Um, under such conditions, we uh, should not have any differences in the ranks of democracy. We have to be um, uh, courageous and we have to be decisive. We have to increase sanctions against Russia and uh, um, um, block all the loopholes uh, and um, um, stop uh, access of Russia to any kind of resources to continue this war. The uh, frozen assets should be used uh, for support of Ukraine. Russia should pay. International law provides all the grounds for the use, not just um, uh, income and uh, interest, uh, but the assets themselves. We are calling upon uh, our partners for decisive action. We discuss economic um, uh, resilience and energy security of Ukraine. We are grateful to the US and the UK for support of our energy sector. And for our colleagues on uh, engagement of ammunition with chemical uh, components uh, and uh, their use against our uh, soldiers uh, and the necessity to have a um, very severe collective action um, uh, in response to that. We discussed the second peace summit. Uh, we rely upon the support of uh, the US and British uh, dem diplomacy in uh, expanding the coalition of, for the uh, peace formula and uh, the number of uh, signatories. The, form uh, the peace formula has no alternative. We discussed uh, specifically further integration of Ukraine and uh, accession to um, to NATO. This uh, is a priority, and this is our steady course. We are approaching accession, and membership uh, of in NATO for Ukraine is the necessary precondition for sustainable and uh, steady peace in Europe. Uh, in closing, I would like to uh, say that so we. Uh, 
observed uh, high awareness among our partners and the uh, recognition of the fact that uh, peace and victory in Ukraine are part and parcel in the talk of uh, the future of Europe and the world, all the world. This has been a very busy day. Now I'm turning it over to Anthony Blinken. Thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you for your, your hospitality today, but also thank you for the very good work uh, we've been able to do today. Um, I was very pleased uh, as well with uh, David Lyman to be able to spend time with President Zelensky and, and other colleagues. And uh, the Foreign Secretary and I came to Ukraine today to really hear from our partners how we can continue to work together to help Ukraine defend its people, defend its territory through the fall fighting season into the winter as Putin continues his vicious war of aggression. And also, how to continue to set up Ukraine for success as a strong, independent country for the long term. Uh, we're going to take what we learned back to President Biden, in my case, and the Prime Minister in David's case. Uh, the two of them will meet in just a few days' time in Washington to discuss how our countries will continue to support Ukraine. And we'll also use what we learned to further rally support among many countries that are behind Ukraine. We'll be at the UN General Assembly in uh, just a couple of weeks' time. Uh, we'll be meeting with uh, many allies and partners uh, as well who are in uh, NATO, the G7, uh, the compact of states that have signed bilateral security agreements with Ukraine. All of this is happening in the, in the coming weeks. Um, it's important that the Ukrainian people continue to hear directly from us. We remain fully committed to Ukraine's victory to not only ensuring that Ukraine can defend itself today, but can stand on its own feet strongly, militarily, economically, democratically, for many, many days ahead, to securing the path the Ukrainian people have chosen toward greater integration in the Euro-Atlantic community, including the European Union and NATO, to getting a just and lasting peace. The bottom line is this, we want Ukraine to win. And we're fully committed to keep marshalling the support that it needs for its brave defenders and citizens to do just that. Now, support for Ukraine will endure because it doesn't depend on any one country, any one party, any one election. Here today, the United States, the United Kingdom are united in support of Ukraine and its success. But we're united along with dozens of other countries including the enduring coalition of more than 50 countries that have provided more than $100 billion in security aid to Ukraine since February of 2022 and continue to materially support Ukraine today. Our message, our collective message to Putin is clear. Our support will not wane. Our unity will not break. Putin will not outlast the coalition of countries committed to Ukraine's success, and he is certainly not going to outlast the Ukrainian people. They've never wavered in their belief that they, and they alone, will decide their future. Now, we have challenging moments. This is a challenging moment as well, uh, with uh, an expansion of attacks from Russia, pummeling Ukrainian cities, citizens, infrastructure, with monstrous brutality. And now Putin's further empowering his aggression with the acquisition of Iranian ballistic missiles. So we're working with urgency to continue to ensure that Ukraine has what it needs to effectively defend itself. At the NATO summit back in July, President Biden promised five strategic air defense systems and dozens of tactical air defense systems. We've delivered on several of those strategic systems. We're fully working to meet the commitment in the coming weeks, and we'll continue to add to Ukraine's air defense systems. We've also supported and trained the F-16 program that is now flying over Ukraine. The United States continues to be the largest provider of security assistance to Ukraine and to lead the international coalition in support of its defense. Uh, as we're meeting here today, we're again seeing Putin dust off his winter playbook, targeting Ukrainian energy and electricity systems to weaponize the cold against the Ukrainian people. That's why today we're announcing $325 million in new funding to help repair Ukraine's energy and electric grid. And we'll rally additional support from the G7 plus countries when we have a meeting of the Energy Coordination Group in the next couple of weeks. 
I'm also announcing today $290 million in new humanitarian support to help provide vital services like safe drinking water, food, shelter, medicine to millions of people in Ukraine and around the region who've been displaced by Putin's war. And finally, we're announcing $102 million in additional funding in humanitarian demining to help remove landmines and unexploded ordnance that Russia's left behind across Ukraine. Now, support for Ukraine's defense and recovery is not only coming from Ukraine's partners. The United States and our G7 partners agreed to deliver $50 billion from Russia's frozen assets to pay for Ukraine's reconstruction and defense. And we're working to meet that commitment to operationalize it. And we and our allies will continue to impose costs on countries that support Russia's war machine. For all of these challenges, Ukraine has made remarkable progress on each of its key goals since I was last here, which is back in May. They've made progress militarily in standing up a strong enduring capacity to deter and defend against aggression. At the July summit, we declared that Ukraine's path to NATO membership is irreversible. And for the first time, NATO established a command dedicated to support Ukraine's membership. Last time I was here, nine countries had completed bilateral security agreements with Ukraine. Now that number is 26 and counting, including of course the United States and the United Kingdom. That will provide a foundation of support for Ukraine's defense for years to come. And Ukraine's defense industrial base has grown sixfold in the last year alone. In the coming years, that's gonna give Ukraine one of the most advanced defense industries in the world, and it will be able to take that to the global market and take global market share away from other countries like Russia and also supply NATO allies. Ukraine's making economic progress. Uh, we've been taking steps to make it easier for investors and companies to do business here in Ukraine. For example, together with the private sector, we recently announced a first of its kind, $350 million war risk reinsurance facility. That's going to make it easier for companies to invest even as the war goes on. And Ukraine continues to make progress on deepening its democracy. It's taken important steps, including the RADA recently passing a law to reform oversight of financial crimes, expanding the number of judges on the anti-corruption court, delivering prosecutions in high profile corruption cases. The active engagement and leadership on the part of Ukraine's engaged and committed civil society has been crucial to this progress. Now, more work needs to be done on reform. Ukraine needs to ensure investors and businesses that they're treated fairly and don't have to compete in a gray market. Ukraine needs institutions that are independent, effective, and free from political interference. That's crucial for the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, for its regulatory bodies and the boards of state-owned enterprises, and for the customs legislation that's currently before the RADA. These and other reforms Ukraine is pursuing because it's in Ukraine's interest to do so. It's what the Ukrainian people want. It's also essential as Ukraine moves down the path to the European Union and to NATO. The enduring commitment of the Ukrainian people is one of the main reasons that we're confident Ukraine will keep moving forward. No matter how great the obstacles thrown in their way, Ukrainians have demonstrated time and again that nothing can stand in the way of a people committed to shaping their own future. Thank you, Andrew, for welcoming me here to Kyiv. Uh, and thank you, Tony, for joining me on this important and historic visit. I last visited in May, and I return today at a vital time because we are united in our ironclad support for Ukraine. For two and a half years, you have bravely and fiercely defended yourselves against Russia's full-scale invasion. But as we heard today, Putin's ugly attempts to restore the Russian empire began much earlier with the illegal annexation of Crimea 10 years ago. Putin claims he wishes to liberate Ukrainian civil civilians, but he denies the right of their nation to exist. He has sent in tanks and soldiers to enforce his diktat, and he inflicts horrors 
on Crimea and other regions of Ukraine under the Russian yoke with stories of forced disappearances, sinister re-education camps and torture. Putin's barbaric actions are the latest example of a very old and evil story. One of my ancestors was taken from their home, enslaved, chained on a ship, and forced to work for the profit of a foreign empire. He knew too, only too well what imperialism was. No act of authoritarianism is ever exactly the same. But 80 years after Stalin deported the Crimean Tatars, 240 years after Catherine the Great annexed Crimea, Putin has revealed the same arrogance, the same greed, the same disdain for the rights of other individuals and nations. This is imperialism, this is fascism. And this week we have rem been reminded of how other authoritarian regimes are aiding Putin with Iran going even further in support for Moscow by providing ballistic missiles, a significant and dangerous escalation. Britain and the US and our partners have responded quickly to Tehran's undermining of global security. Britain has sanctioned Iranian officials and entities, as well as Russian entities, and cargo ships involved in the transfer of weapons. And together we've restricted Iran's air flights to Europe. This response is in keeping with our commitment to remain Ukraine's staunchest friend. And I'm proud of that commitment. I'm proud of Prime Minister Starmer's commitment to provide three billion in military aid every year that is needed in your fight. And today I can confirm more than 600 million worth of support for Ukraine, including 242 million this financial year for immediate humanitarian energy and stabilization needs, as well as support for reform, recovery and reconstruction. Plus we're confirming our intention to deploy $484 million worth of World Bank loan guarantees later this year. And the UK is speeding up military deliveries with air defense missiles, equipment of F-16 fighter jets, AS-90 self-propelled guns and spare barrels, military boats and maritime guns having now been delivered. I can announce we will now also send hundreds of additional air defense missiles, tens of thousands of additional artillery ammunition rounds, and more armored vehicles to Ukraine by the end of the year. But I am most proud of the unity we and our allies have shown in support for Ukraine. And that is why our joint visit today, the first joint visit of its kind for well over a decade, is such an important signal. Together, Britain and our allies are united in our commitment to Ukraine, to freedom, to victory, because we both recognize what is at stake here, not just the liberty of Ukraine, but the security of Europe and the security of the West, and indeed the very principles that underpin the UN Charter, on which rests the international order as it stands which has brought peace and prosperity to so many. It's good to be with here. It's good to stand with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellencies. We'll now take a few questions, starting with Michael Birbaum from VAPO. I only have one microphone, so. Thanks very much, uh, Michael Birnbaum from the Washington Post. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Foreign Secretary, um, question about attackums. Uh, how and uh, long-range missile storm shadows. How worried are you at this point about managing escalation with Russia based on your conversations today? And does the Ukrainian desire to use 
attack and storm shadows, long-range missiles against the Kerch Bridge uh, that connects Crimea to mainland Russia makes sense to you strategically. Um, and what's your personal view of whether Ukraine needs this long-range capability of striking into Russian territory, especially now that, as you say, Iran has facilitated um, uh, uh, Russia's ability to strike more deeply into uh, Ukraine. And um, Mr. Foreign Minister, um, uh, former President Donald Trump was asked a couple times last night at the debate uh, whether he was committed to Ukrainian victory. Uh, he said he wanted the war to end as quickly as possible, but he didn't say yes to victory. Um, I wanted to ask what you made of that and what kind of plans you are making in case there is a change in U.S. policy sometime soon. Thanks a lot. Michael, thank you very much. I'm happy to, happy to start. Um, first, we had a very good discussion today with uh, the Foreign Minister, with President Zelensky, with his whole team about um, the situation on the battlefield, uh, Ukraine's objectives, and uh, what it needs to succeed uh, going forward. Uh, and among other things, we discussed long-range fires, but a number of other things as well. And as I said at the outset, um, I'm going to take that discussion back uh, to Washington uh, to uh, brief the president on, on what I heard. I know that, uh, that David's doing the same. And both of our bosses, no doubt, will discuss this when they meet um, later this week, actually on Friday, uh, in Washington. Um, just speaking for the United States, um, from day one, as you've heard me say, uh, we have uh, adjusted and adapted as needs have changed, as the battlefield has changed, um, and I have no doubt that we'll continue to do that as this, uh, as this, as this evolves. You, you referenced uh, escalation. Of course, that's one of the factors that we always consider, but it's certainly not uh, the only factor, and um, it's, uh, it's not necessarily a dispositive factor. Um, we um, have provided, as you know, extraordinary support to Ukraine over these uh, more than two years. Uh, not just training, uh, not just money, but among our most sophisticated weapon systems. Again, tied to what their needs are, tied to what can make them most, uh, most effective. And I think the track record is, is there. Uh, we're determined to ensure that they have what they need to succeed. Uh, and when it comes to escalation, you made the point yourself. Uh, we've seen Russia now uh, pursue and indeed escalate its attacks inside Ukraine on civilians, on energy infrastructure, uh, as well as on the Ukrainian military that's defending its country. And uh, we've now seen this action of Russia, Russia acquiring ballistic missiles from Iran, which will further empower their aggression in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, if anyone is taking escalatory action, it would appear to be Mr. Putin uh, and Russia. Um, I'll leave uh, specific uh, uh, targets and, and questions for the, uh, the, the, uh, the experts. And of course, <laughs> I don't have personal views. I have professional views uh, in my capacity as Secretary of State. And um, I'll be uh, sharing what we've learned on this trip with the President in the coming days. The escalator is Putin. <laughs> It is Putin who has escalated this week with the shipment of ballistic missiles from Iran. And we're seeing this new axis, Russia, Iran, North Korea. We urge China not to throw their lot in with this group of renegades, renegades in the end that are costing lives here in Ukraine. So it's been very important for me to be here with Secretary Blinken to meet, to listen, to learn, to strategize, yes, uh, and to be able to inform the UK Prime Minister uh, as we head out to Washington for further discussions. I'm also minded that as we head into the autumn, we have the UN General Assembly where we're meeting with allies and parts of global majority countries also to ensure that we have that support for Ukraine as we head into the late autumn and the winter. We have the G20, other forums, and we've wanted to talk about how we build on those opportunities going forward and how we put Ukraine 
in the best possible position as they head into a winter. And that has been the basis of the discussion. But let us be clear, we've not just talked about military support. We've talked further about sanctions. We've talked further about the humanitarian needs. We've had a detailed conversation about energy because of horrendous Russian attacks on energy supplies here in Ukraine. So this has been a breadth of conversation across the board about very strong allies and about our commitment. The UK commitment is not just for this winter. We're talking about a hundred year partnership because we stand with Ukraine for the long haul. I fully agree with the uh, our partners uh, take on the escalation and uh, let me add on my own part that uh, I remember very well when before any kind of principal uh, decision for supply of some new type of equipment or new batch of equipment, we would also review the issue of escalation. Still, the decisions would be made. We had enough uh, willpower and enough uh, strength in our partners to take such decisions. After the Kursk operation of the Ukrainian military, we can say clearly that uh, we have uh, crossed uh, the line of this uh, fear of escalation. Now about possible outcome of the presidential election in the US. Uh, we will, uh, without any doubt, have a new president of the United States, but we believe in uh, steadfast support uh, from the US nation, the American nation. We believe strongly into bipartisan support. Um, and uh, we clearly believe and we are convinced that fair, comprehensive, uh, sustainable peace in Ukraine is also a strategic interest for the United States of America. And uh, that will be maintained because we're here to protect our um, joint values, common values of democracy. And we believe that uh, strategic democratic leadership of uh, the US is here to stay. Emma Murphy from ITV News. If I could um, pose a question to you, Foreign Secretary, and also you, Secretary of State, with regard to President Zelensky's comments today. He said that he would like to see a strong decision on the use of long-range missiles into Russia. How confident are you that you can take a message back to your superiors that will convince them of the need for that and get over divisions within your own governments potentially about the risk of escalation. And also, um, Mr. Foreign Secretary, could I ask how important it is to Ukraine on the battlefield that long-range missiles are allowed? Question. We've had detailed conversations today with President Zelensky. We recognize that Ukraine is on the front line of the fight for freedom and also that over these last few weeks we've seen a tremendous loss of life of innocent men, women and children here in Ukraine. And I and the Secretary of State rededicate ourselves to supporting Ukraine at this particular time. President Zelensky expressed gratitude and thanks for Britain's three billion a year commitment that will continue for as long as this fight is needed. He expressed thanks for the milestone of the International Fund for Ukraine, the one billion that we are committed to. Uh, and he's grateful for the new package of military support, ammunition, brimstone missiles, AS-90 artillery guns, that we are providing. We are concerned about the attacks on Ukraine's energy. We are concerned about these glide bombs. We are concerned about the drones. We're very concerned about the escalatory action that we're seeing from um, Iran particularly. We've looked at the breadth of things today. And as we've said, of course, I go back to 
Keir Starmer able to assist him with some of the operational detail that we've learned from the Ukrainians today. You wouldn't expect me to go into detail about that at this press conference because I am not prepared to give Putin the advantage. But as the closest of allies, we look forward to discussions we will have, not just on Friday, but discussions, I suspect, that will go on over the next few weeks as we head also to the UN General Assembly. Uh, good evening, the public broadcaster of Ukraine, uh, Valeria Pashko. So, uh, Minister Spiga uh, mentioned the Ukrainian path to NATO. So, is it possible that uh, allies uh, ready to invite Ukraine to join NATO, NATO maybe this year? And uh, one more. So, the coalition uh, within NATO is being formed to shoot down drones and missiles over Ukraine. Maybe there is a discussion between, um, I don't know, Great Britain and uh, the US and uh, Germany. Uh, and um, I think the, uh, the last one, um, are you ready to uh, invest in Ukrainian production of drones, maybe missiles as well? Thanks a lot. United Kingdom is already investing in Ukrainian production of drones. Um, and what I saw on my last trip to Ukraine was a amazing civilian, what we would call a blitz spirit, evoking the Second World War. Um, ordinary people committed to the war effort here in Ukraine. It's humbling. It's moving to see people doing all they can uh, to prevent this Russian uh, aggression. Britain are supportive of Ukraine's ambitions in relation to NATO and the security guarantees that they necessarily need. And that's why we work very hard with our allies to get that irreversible pathway language um, into the text uh, that we were able to agree uh, back um, in July, just as the new Labour government uh, came um, to power. Uh, and we will continue, of course, to discuss these things with our allies. And the other issue, of course, that Secretary Blinken has raised today um, is the continued need to work with Ukraine on these fundamental reform issues um, that make its pathway um, to the European Union uh, and to NATO more achievable in the medium term. And it's really just to um, reiterate what the Foreign Secretary said, uh, NATO allies came together, made clear that Ukraine's path to NATO is irreversible, and now Ukraine is moving down that path. I mentioned a few moments ago that for the first time in NATO's history, it has stood up a dedicated command whose purpose is to help NATO move down the path to membership. And that command is up and running. Uh, and we have a representative here in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so all of that is moving forward. Uh, and it's important that as that moves forward, Ukraine continue to move forward on the necessary uh, reforms. But we see that on track uh, and moving forward. With regard to the de defense in, uh, industrial base, I mentioned as well a moment ago, um, Ukraine's defense industrial base has increased six times over the last couple of years. That's the result of tremendous investment that uh, a number of us have made. I think what's so important about that is that it also sets up Ukraine for the long term because one measure of success, one measure of Ukraine's success is going to be its capacity to stand strongly on its own feet militarily as well as economically and democratically. And militarily, these investments in the defense industrial base, the production of what it needs to defend itself, not just today, but for many years to come, is the best way to guarantee that there's not a repeat of Russian aggression, that Ukraine has the capacity to deter aggression and, if necessary, to defend against it. Uh, we're also taking steps, besides making direct investments ourselves, as Foreign Secretary uh, alluded to, we're also trying to make it uh, easier for the private sector to do more in Ukraine, even in the midst of the Russian aggression. 
Some of the risk insurance uh, is critical to that, and we've set up a facility uh, to do that. I think um, companies around the world see Ukraine as a very attractive place for investment, even with the ongoing uh, aggression because of Ukrainian capacity, and that includes the defense industrial base. Deputy Secretary of State um, Verma was just here uh, a few days ago bringing um, members of the uh, American private sector with them, including from the uh, defense industry, and we expect things to come out of that. So all of this is moving forward. And again, I just want to emphasize, there are two, two goals in mind. Make sure that Ukraine has what it needs now to deal with the ongoing Russian aggression, but also make sure that it has what it needs to have an enduring success, to be a strong, independent country, increasingly integrated with the institutions of the your Atlantic community, including the European Union and including NATO. I'd like to comment your question as to the necessity to shoot down Russian missiles and drones over Ukraine. Uh, we already have some incidents of violation of uh, airspace of uh, neighboring countries by Russia, uh, NATO countries, and we think that Russia, by doing that, is testing the decisiveness and unity of NATO. That's why we need to have this firm answer uh, of the allies to such a provocative and es an escalation by Russia, who are more often a target uh, the targets close to the border with NATO, the uh, tar targets uh, close to the nuclear power stations in Ukraine, and they also target our underground uh, storages, which are close to the western borders of Ukraine. Our security agreement signed by uh, Zelensky and Tusk, there is a paragraph saying that uh, the practical phase of uh, consultations among allies uh, about shooting down uh, missiles uh, over Ukraine. And we think this would be a good and a right step towards that. Today I had a conversation with the uh, General Secretary of NATO and I thanked him for his uh, position as to this issue. Secondly, you asked about our path towards NATO and speed to achieve that. I was next to Zelensky to, when he was in a bunker after uh, February 24th. And on the second day, President Zelensky made a decision to file uh, the, uh, to file the pet petition to join the European Union. It, just to give you an idea, to understand the spirit was in the air. At that time, the Russian troops were right next to Kyiv. We had we could hear the artillery shooting, but out of strategic uh, considerations, he made a decision. On the fourth day, he prepared uh, all the paperwork, and we filed that file file that petition and in four months we we achieved that so having done the home assignment and meeting the requirements that's why we need a quick and historical decisions as to bringing ukraine as to bring ukraine's membership in nato closer if there is a political will we are ready to become nato member today thank you